So here we are, first Sunday of Advent, and um, the theme for the next four weeks is Come and Behold Him. Now, Advent can be a time of distraction or of focus, a time of purpose or going around in circles, can be fun or stress. What are your tendencies? Well, it depends what day you ask me. Um, I can do all of those, I think. It's a funny time. Is this too loud? Do you want it down a bit? Is it okay? I, f- I feel quite echoey. All right. Um, so in a nutshell, our Advent series, Come and Behold Him. Come. We are invited. Behold. What will we see? What will we hear? And him, Jesus. Can we get to know him a little bit more? So behold isn't really a word we use very much at the moment, but perhaps a little bit more at this time of year, and perhaps it pops up in nativity plays and things like that. Sometimes when we use words less, they can either be a bit niche or a bit mysterious. But to behold just means to see or observe. The more you stop and look, the more you'll consider something. And the more you might notice. And it's in the noticing that you might see something new. And you might have a new insight. And so I encourage you in this season to see something new. And see where that insight leads. Hearing God's voice is part of beholding him. And it's a challenge to hear God. And the key to it is knowing him. And it takes time and it takes perseverance to get to know someone, as all relationships do. I'm going to tell a few stories today, and um, lots of opportunities to judge me, I've realised. Um, so that's interesting. Um, I'd, I'd like to tell you a story about um, getting to know someone's voice. I, um, in the springtime... I knew that I was going to be leaving my previous place of employment. And I had the opportunity, before everybody knew this, to get some feedback on um, what they thought I did well and what I needed to work on. I knew that I'd probably have a dip in confidence at some point, and I thought it would be really nice to have some evidence of things that other people said I did well, as well as things that I knew I could work on. And so the way it worked was I asked, um, well, I nominated sort of 12 to 15 people that I worked with in different places in the organisation to anonymously give me some feedback. And uh, basically things I did well and things I didn't do well. And then it came to me in a grid. And it was really really helpful, actually. I had a nice list of things which I did well, which was really encouraging for me and things I could put on my CV and take forward. And uh, the things that I needed to work on, obviously the dream is that that's blank, um, but it wasn't, uh, and that was fine. Um, lots of things, I was like, yes, not so good at that, not so good at that. And then there was one bit that really hit me, and I thought, oh gosh. And it said that um, the tone of my emails was really direct, and um, that really stopped me in my tracks, really. Um, I really value efficiency and clarity, so I always work really hard to make sure that what I needed to say was short and quick, because we got a lot of emails, so I didn't want to sort of prose it up too much. However, it obviously hadn't landed too well. And um, at that point, I thought, "Mm, maybe I don't need feedback after all. Uh, (laughs) And it played on my mind a little bit, and I was a little bit like, "Mm." so I talked to another colleague who I knew hadn't done the anonymous feedback, so I knew it wasn't him. And I said, I've had this feedback about my emails, and um, we chat quite a lot, and... I said to him, it said they were really direct. And then he paused, and I thought, oh, no. Um, And he said, I can see what they're saying, but when I read your emails, I can hear your voice behind what's being said, so I know how to take it, and I know know what you're trying to say. And I thought that was really nice, and actually, I feel that's the same with God. When we read his word, the more we know of him, the more we can hear his voice speaking, the more we know what he's trying to say. So when we're reading the word or if we're reading situations, if we can hear his voice in that, um, we will feel guided by him. Um, So I want to think a little bit about hearing his voice this Advent, and that's our prayer for us, really, that as, as the weeks and the busyness ramps up, 
we can hold on to his voice. So today's reading, which we're going to have in just a minute, I've got a real treat for you because Roland's going to read. Um, This reading's really familiar, so I've taken a slightly different version of the Bible, which is called The Voice. Um, And I've chosen that to see if we can see something new or hear something new. Um, The bit of the Bible it is, it refers to Jesus as the Word, which in the original Greek is um, logos, which also points to lots of different meanings, which can um, come to expression, message, declaration, reason, and more. So as Roland reads, what will you notice? What will you hear? Before time itself was measured, the voice was speaking. The voice was and is God. This celestial word remained ever present with the creator. His speech shaped the entire cosmos. Immersed in the practice of creating, All things that exist were birthed in him. His breath filled all things with a living, breathing light, a light that thrives in the depths of darkness, blazes through murky deeps. It cannot and will not be quenched. A man named John, who was sent by God, was the first to clearly articulate the source of this light. This baptizer put in plain words the elusive mystery of the divine light so all might believe through him. Some wondered whether he might be the light, but John was not the light. He merely pointed to the light. The true light who shines upon the heart of everyone, was coming into the cosmos. Jesus, as the light, does not call out from a distant place, but draws near by coming into the world. He entered our world, a world he made, yet the world did not recognize him. Even though he came to his own people, they refused to listen and receive him. But for all who did receive him and trust in him, he gave them the right to be reborn as children of God. He bestowed this birthright not by human power or initiative, but by God's will. The voice took on flesh and became human and chose to live alongside us. We have seen him enveloped in undeniable splendor, the one true son of the Father, evidence in the perfect balance of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in that reading, John takes us right back to Genesis, right back to before the beginning, in fact. And um, it makes the point that Jesus was right there before the beginning, before creation. Jesus wasn't created mid-Bible because things were going wrong. There wasn't a new plan or a new course. He was there from the beginning, and he was at creation and part of creation. So when Jesus came as a baby, he'd very much, as the song says, laid aside his majesty and he'd emptied himself of all but love. He put aside all his power and all his authority. He that is greater than all things confined himself to the container of a baby. And as soon as Mary was pregnant, Jesus was vulnerable to the choices of his own creation. The creator of the concept of sound had to learn how to make and understand different noises. The creator of communication and language 
had to learn how to tame his own vocal cords so he could speak and learn to speak Aramaic, which is a very tricky language, I hear. This voice was the voice from the beginning, and now it was being heard by human ears. It says in our reading, verse 14, the voice took on flesh and became human and chose to live alongside us. He chose this. He chose himself to confine himself to the limitations of being a human. And then in verse 9, it says, Jesus as the light does not call out from a distant place, but draws near by coming into the world. He's not shouting at us from afar. He's speaking to us. He doesn't want to be distant, but he does give us choice and independence. And so he invites us to come to him because he was there first. And now we have the Holy Spirit that can live within us so we can hear the voice of God for ourselves. Hearing his voice is a challenge, but it's worth the seeking. And even now, in my experience, I don't think he's a shouter. So you need to give yourself silence and space to hear the small voice that we hear of in 1 Kings when Elijah heard the Lord in a gentle whisper. So be open to hearing his voice when you read scripture and you read situations. In John 10, verse 27, Jesus himself says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And then in 10 chapters later in the same book, Mary's outside the tomb where where she thought Jesus was laid, mistaking Jesus because her vision was blurred. It was only when he spoke to her and said her name, she knew his voice with one word. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a time when I struggled to hear God's voice because the comparison was stark. Hearing God's voice makes things um, simpler and efficient, which I like. Um, But there was a time when I didn't hear God's voice very well, and it was tough. Um, I became a Christian when I was about 11 years old, approximately, and um, I think it's brilliant to become a Christian when you're a young person, because quite often you've not known a time, you haven't had a time when you don't know about God, which is brilliant, so you've always walked in the knowledge of him. Um, The challenge of being a Christian when you are a young person is, the older you get, the worse your sins are. And then you realize that these terrible people in the Bible, like the tax collectors and the undesirables, that's what you're becoming, and that you were no better than them, and uh, Jesus redeems you just as much as everybody else. And and that's a hard realization when you think God's got a bargain in you at 11. Um, So the older I got, the the more I sinned, obviously, And uh, I learned to confess. I was really conscious of my sin. I felt I could um, go back to God. I knew that I could confess to him. I knew he would forgive me uh, the bigger the the sins became. Uh, But about 15 years ago, um, after quite a time of illness, my sister went to be with the Lord. And um, I felt that events were changing around me and that I... um, I didn't notice my sin in that, and my sin was that I took my trust away from God. And that was tricky, because I was quite confused about the situation, and it certainly didn't suit me. And I found myself talking at God and telling him that uh, he could have done a better job, and he could have done it so many different ways. Um, He was very gracious at the time, I must say. He's very gracious. I told him a lot of things. Um, I thought it was a really bad idea. My mistake was not to trust him. I took my eyes away from him. I looked away. And I sort of faded off in a cloud of confusion. But the sin was still mine because I took my trust away. I just didn't realize it. It was a horrible time. And uh, there was lots of sadness. And it also felt like time stood still. Uh, The shining light of the situation was that I had two small children who were amazing distraction at the time. I had a a two-and-a-half-year-old boy who just didn't want to walk anywhere, so he hit the speed of light, it felt like. I spent a lot of time chasing him, and um, I know lots of you remember that speed. And um, so I spent most of my days running, um, 
And at night, I had an eight-month-old daughter who loved being awake all the time. And so I'd had eight months of being awake, or so it felt like. I'm sure there was some sleep. And so daytime running, or if I wasn't running, I was sort of in ready position, ready for the next run. And then at night time, uh, not sleeping. And so um, I think God protected my brain, really, because I processed the information really slowly about my sister. And I think it, um, that helped, actually. Um, but I was off in this cloud of confusion. And time went on, and I knew that I drifted away from God. I didn't really know how I'd done it, but I had, because I'd taken my gaze from him. And so I'm not really sure how long I was in that stage for because I was a little bit tired. Um, it could have been two weeks. It could have been three weeks. It could have been three months. I really don't know. Um, and eventually I realized that God was, a far, was far, far away and I wanted to do something about it. And um, there was a phrase that used to be on mugs and pens and things like that. And it said, if God feels far away, guess who moved? And that's because he's always been there. And then I realized that I must be far away from him because I, I moved. And so I wanted to be nearer to God, and I didn't really know how to go about it. Um, I felt events had separate us, separated us rather than me, so I couldn't quite work it out. And um, I wasn't conscious of the sin to repent of. I hadn't really worked out at that point that my trust had been taken away from him. Um, which meant that my usual way of going back to him and repenting, I couldn't quite work out how to do that. Um, I love the phrase in today's reading that says, his breath filled all living things with a living, breathing light, a light that thrives in the depths of darkness. So despite me being in darkness, the light was still there. And so I think he helped me get back to him. So I started to think of all the things I knew of God to be true. And I tried to search for a little bit that made sense of him. So I sort of pictured in my mind, Holy Spirit, mm, tricky to picture, dove, no, not really, uh, water, wind, not helping. Jesus, saviour, friend, not right now. Um, God, creator, mighty one, eternal, not helping. Sovereign. Okay, sovereign. Could go with that. Sovereign king. God the king. God the king. God the king. This is, my brain was not good. Um, so I thought, okay, God the king. What now? Far away king, I thought. Okay. So I used my imagination, which is not usual for me. Um, I keep that in a safe place. Um, so in my imagination, I pictured, right, where's God going to be? Where's God going to be? In a castle. Okay. So I pictured a far away castle, and it's slightly over a hill. So all I could see was kind of flags waving in the distance. And I thought, right, God's over there, and I want to get to him. Um, how are we going to get there? So I imagined in a path, which was under my feet. And I thought, deep breath, and I thought, okay, I'm ready. So I started to walk towards this castle, and I walked and I walked and I walked, and obviously I was getting nearer to God, and that felt better in itself. Um, and obviously I got nearer to the castle, nearer to the castle, and then I was there. And when I saw the castle, the drawbridge was down and the gates were open, and I have to say to you, with God, the drawbridge is always down. The gates are always open. We are welcome. And so I walked in. And I walked into this castle, and I was going through big room after big room, great grand halls. And I was walking through, and I was walking through. And then I knew that the next hall was the throne room. So I took a little breath and went, right, here we go. And um, then I saw the throne. It was, it was massive, so I didn't see it all. So I just saw these uprighty bits with the armrests. That's all I could see. And, um, and then a white robe sort of down to the floor. And that's all I could see. So I'll just put a pause on that. That was my imagination. I'd used it. I tried to come to God in a different way. And that's how I got to him. I knew that being closer to him was the answer. And I needed to get past this barrier um, to get back to him. It's very elaborate. You don't have to do that. Um, you just have to say, God, I'm here. You really don't. 
But for me, I needed something, and using your imagination is something people do quite a lot at times to picture God if it helps them. So in James 4, verse 8, it says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. He's already there. So what happened next, I believe God did, for three reasons. Firstly, I didn't see what was going to come next. Secondly, some of the color choices really weren't mine. And thirdly, (laughs) it was better than I could have imagined. It was very cool. Um, So God took what I gave him, which was this picture of him, and he took it on and came closer to me. So what I saw next happening was what I believe God gave to me. And so this is what I saw. I saw the throne um, sidey bits. They kind of got shorter and they got wider. And then the top bits sort of curled over. And then they were covered in fabric. And um, it looked like an armchair. And then the white robe sort of swirled round. And then there were corduroy trousers and brown slippers. And... um, Then I saw two hands come and swoop me up and turn me around and put me on the lap, and we read a book. And I thought that was quite cool. And I remember Lisa saying a few weeks ago about meeting God as the father, and it feels a bit like the railway children where where she says, Daddy, my daddy. And God the king, who I approached, became God my father. I was sat on solid ground, and I was given solace and peace and acceptance I was not given a good talking to about my rudeness or my better ideas or my moods. And um, I guess if I was Hannah in the Old Testament, I might have sung an exciting song praising God. Or indeed, Mary may have echoed in, you know, I wasn't really up to that. And I sat there and went, oh, oh, I'm all right now. That was it. Um, Now, what I didn't mean by that was that my situation was the same. I was still really sad. My sister had gone, and I was still running around all day, and I was still up all night, and I was sad. But I was back with God. And I knew that he was saying, yeah, I know you don't get it. Um, I know you think another way would have been better. I know you're sad and tired, but just sit with me. In Psalm 73... Someone, uh, the psalmist, gets distracted by the world and thinks that being with God maybe isn't the best way. He gets quite jealous of people doing well without God. And he wavers a little bit. But in the end, he decides to stay with God. And right at the end of the psalm, he says, But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. And in Acts 3, verse 19, it says, Times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. And that's what I experienced. He didn't change very much about my life, but I knew that I was in his presence again, and I began to hear his voice in my situation. So this Advent season, come. You are invited, just as you are. Don't wait to be good enough, clever enough, in control of all the facts, because you won't. Come and behold him, Jesus, the voice from before the beginning, creator, saviour, and the way to God the Father. Come and behold. It's in the noticing that you will have new insights. Come and behold him, so you can be held by him. Behold, so you can be held. Being held by him will mean different things to all of us. You might be carried by him. You might be walking with him. You may be hiding in him as a refuge. But if you are held by him, you'll be close enough to hear his voice. So that's the invitation. Come and behold him. What will you hear and see this Advent? Amen.